Swiss collective passport. This meant that the applicants stood under formal Swiss protection. Needless to say that this procedure was not in line with the policy of Switzerland. Only much later in fall, the German and Hungarian authorities became aware of his rules. When emigration to Palestine and issuing letters of protection made it necessary to increase his staff, he decided in July 44 to move the emigration department of the Swiss legation to the Glasshouse building. The Glasshouse stood under diplomatic protection and also became a center and the headquarters of the Chalutzim and the Jewish resistance. What a risk he took. But him, for ma the main thing was to rescue as many Jewish lives as possible. For this, he risked his life, his career, and his health. Why did he do this? His motivation. The laws of life are stronger as man-made regulations. That's how he thought, and that's how he acted. He was not born a hero. He was rather shy and introverted. But as the, an engaged Christian, he was a Methodist, he could not tolerate the Jews being pursued and killed. He was grown up with a poor Methodist family in Switzerland, in eastern Switzerland, together with nine brothers and sisters. His mother, the most important person in his life, was a very strong personality and a deeply religious woman. My father adopted her ethics. When he saw the misery of the Jews, he felt that God gave him this task and that God would give him the strength to fulfill it. Uh, let me tell you about the scene he remembered was the most terrible in his life during these uh, last months of the war in 1944. It was a scene in Obuda Camp Brickyard where thousands of Jews were gathered and Gertrude, his first wife, accompanied him. These are his personal notes about it. 5,000 of those unhappy people were standing in line, freezing, shaking, hungry, with tiny packs on their shoulders, <laughs> stretching their letters toward me. Again and again, the police had to intervene to prevent my clothes from being torn from my back. For these people, it was the last glimmer of hope. It was the first the worst form of spiritual torture. We saw people being lashed with dog whips, lying in the slime and run mud in mud with bloody faces. Wherever to help to try, try to help them was treated with rifles. And yet, we have to declare some of the protective letters as fakes so the others would be recognized. For the people concerned, this was like a death sentence. In the glass house, life-saving documents were issued with the help of 150 Jewish partners, the Chalutzim and the Jewish pioneers. They worked day and night for months. At the end, there were no legal protective letters left, so they forged the documents by tens of thousands. My father knew about all this, but though it was not in conformance with Swiss policy, he tolerated it. By the end of the war, about 3,000 people found refuge in the glass house, and one of them is even here now. The rest stayed in 76 Swiss safe houses in the international ghetto of Budapest, and most of these people survived. I have been in Budapest during these times, as you already heard, I was six years old, and, but I have quite strong memories of this time, and I'm emotionally moved when I talk about this. That's why I can't hold the microphone. From the end of 1944, 
to the liberation in February 1945. We spent two months in the air shelter of the British legation in Buda, <coughs> the residence of the Swiss consul at that time. We were, we, we lived in the cellar with 30 other persons. We had very little water, food, and light. Of our house was hit in January by 20 firebombs and burned down, burned for 48 hours. We were afraid that the fuel tank in the court, filled with 3,000 liters of gas, would explode. Fortunately, this disaster didn't occur. The seller resisted the attack and we survived. Needless to say that for this rescue activity, the cooperation with the Jewish Agency for Palestine was of eminent importance. He could not have issued that many protective letters and guarantee safety and food in the Swiss houses without the Kalutzim, the Jewish pioneers, and other Jewish organizations who gave them help and support. On the other hand, Lutz allowed the Jewish organizations to operate from the glass house. Lutz stayed in Budapest until the end of the war, even when his uh, superiors had left. That, and so he risked his life. The Germans had promised him to guarantee the safety of the Jews in the Swiss protected houses and the recognition of the protective letters as long as he would be present. But his position was weakened in fall 1944 when the Arrow Cross terror began because the federal government in Bern refused to recognize the Nazi government. Switzerland did not acknowledge the valor of the activities of my father for a long time. He was accused of having overstepped his authorities. He got some acknowledgement by the Jewish side. In 1946, the Zionist Congress in Basel, World Zionist Congress in Basel, received him with a standing ovation. Israel, Yad Vashem, honored him in 1964 as a righteous among the nations, and two deep trees were planted in the memory of Karl and Gertrude Lutz in Yad Vashem. And in 1959, a street in Haifa here was named after him, and he has also been proposed for the Peace Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. He, in Switzerland, he got much later the appreciation he deserved, but now we have many projects going on. I get a lot of support, and there will be a film, almost, the film is almost finished, produced by Swiss television company, and will be broadcasted in all three languages in Switzerland in August, and uh, there will also be a movie for a documentary, the same documentary, a longer version for cinemas, and that will uh, help a lot to make his deeds a little better known. The premiere will be in Budapest in June, by the way. But of course, uh, the appreciation from the Swiss, from his home country, which was very important to him, came too late. He died in 1975 at the age of 80 in Bern. I was with him. Thank you. Thank you.